The year was 2012, and Toei had just finished celebrating the 35th anniversary of the Super Sentai franchise with Kaizoku Sentai Go Kaiju, which eventually gained a really huge fan base. After the Space Pirates who grew to love the part of the Earth, it was time to begin an era where Sentai would explore new routes and start thinking outside the box, starting with Tokume Sentai Go Busters. Believe it or not, Go Busters is the very first Sentai series to actually have two opening themes, unless you count Gekko Sentai Car Ranger, but technically their second opening was more of a fast-paced version of the first one. The reason why this is possible is because Go Busters was suffering from low rains at the time, but I'll get to that later. The first theme song, titled Buster's Ready Go, is a very joyous theme, starting up slow and it kicks off with the hype, giving the song a very heroic vibe, making the viewer trust that the Go Busters will save the day. The second theme is titled Morphin' Movin' Buster Show. It has a catchy beat, but I prefer the first one. It's a lot more fast, which makes it a lot more hard to sing along. In the year of Neo AD 2012, Mankind uses a power source known as Enetron for their everyday needs, but an evil organization classified as the Vagloss wants to steal enough Enetron to revive their leader, an evil virus named Messiah. The Energy Management Center recruits three individuals who possess superhuman abilities to become the Go Busters, and alongside their buddy roids, fight to shut down the Vagloss and bring back their families from the subdimension thanks to an incident that happened 13 years ago on Christmas Day. So first off, we have our heroes, the Go Busters, starting off with Hiromu Sakurada, aka Red Buster. He's pretty much a back-to-basics Red Ranger like those from Go Ranger through O Ranger. He's very stern and serious, which are very good qualities for a leader to have. He's also stubborn at times, always taking dangerous risks. He possesses a very strong determination that boosts his desire to get his parents back after they teleport the research center to the sub-dimension. Seeing that, it shows that Hiromu was the most traumatized after losing his parents at such a young age. He also feels very lonely without them because unlike the others, he never trained his whole life to fight back against the Vagalists and instead was raised by his sister and she had a Nick. The other two were never traumatized because they've been trained their whole lives to get back at the Vagalists and they've had a very special bond with one another. The only cons I have for him is that his aforementioned personalities kind of make him a douche, but fortunately the negatives don't overlap the positive. Next up, we have Ryuji Iwasaki, aka Blue Buster. He's more laid back and is also the oldest one of the team, being seen as the older brother archetype of the group, mainly with Yoko. Unfortunately, he's the most underdeveloped of the characters. Unlike the other two, Ryuji never had any loved ones that got teleported into this subdimension, unless if you count Masato Jin, who is his friend and mentor in engineering. Ever since he was young, he's always had a dream of being an engineer, but due to training to be a go buster and being in field combat, he has abandoned that dream. When Jin returned, he gave Ryuji the strength to regain his dream to become an engineer once they are done with defeating the Vagalists. To be honest, saying that out loud kind of makes his abandonment of that goal kind of pointless, but regardless, it does strengthen the determination aspect our characters possess. Then, the sole female member of our group is Yoko Usami, aka Yellow Buster. First off, Dim leg. Being the youngest member of the group, she has a short temper. In the first couple of episodes, she has a huge dislike for Hiromu, jealous that he's getting the special treatment and calls him Siskon, thinking that he's spoiled due to being raised by his sister all this time. But over time, she eventually gains respect for him. She shares a huge bond with Ryuji because they've been together for all these 13 years, with him acting like an older brother to her and took care of her since her mother got teleported into the subdimension. When Yoko learns of his weak point, this does put a different perspective on her bond with Ryuji, but regardless, given how their bond is strong, she is determined to reach out to him even when he doesn't recognize her. With the vaccine, our heroes gain superhuman abilities that is kind of like a callback to the civilian powers of certain Disney-era Power Ranger seasons. Hiromu is given super speed, much like a cheetah, Ryuji has super strength, resembling a gorilla, and Yoko can jump at an immense height, like a rabbit. Unfortunately, due to this, they also have various weaknesses that are labeled as weak points. Whenever Hiromu sees a chicken, he freezes up because he has a fear of them. This was gained back when he was a little kid, and he was locked up in a chicken coop and was attacked by one. Ryuji's weak point is that whenever he fights too much, he overheats and becomes extremely violent, with his voice becoming glitchy. Yoko's weak point is that when she runs out of calories in her body, she becomes immobile and can't move, so to prevent this, she eats candy all the time, especially on missions. What's interesting here is how the weak points are actually a contrast of who they are, where Hiromu is brave and determined, but he's scared of something like a chicken. Ryuji is very calm and friendly, but becomes very scary and violent when he overheats. Yoko is energetic and cheerful, but is slow and weak when immobilized. 
The team is later joined by two new Gold Busters, Masato Jin, aka the Gold Beat Buster, and BJ Stag, his buddy Roy who can transform into the Silver Stag Buster. Masato Jin was one of the engineers that worked with Hiromu and Yoko's parents and was Ryuji's teacher. He as well was teleported into the subdimension and once there, he created his own personal buddy Roy, BJ Stag, where the latter stowed away as crash data during the teleportation of an enemy Megazord in one episode. On Earth, Jay acts as a marker for the avatar of Masato Jin. What's an avatar you say? I'll get to that in a bit. Most of you may know that Masato Jin's actor is Roya Matsumoto, who previously played Tsubasa Ozu from Maho Sentai Maji Ranger, and he was perfect for this role. He knows how to make Jin a quirky and less serious guy, which makes him my favorite member of the group. He doesn't accept perfection, and thinks that flaws are what makes you interesting. He actually plays the mental role better than the actual mentor of the series by motivating the team to become stronger than he is so they can be worthy enough to get into the subdimension. Then there are the buddy roids who don't have arcs in general, but do have differentiating personalities and are very protective towards their partners. These guys are usually the basis for the comic relief for the show. They also have the ability to control the mecha. First is Hiromu's buddy roid, Cheetah Nick, who has the ability to transform into a bike that Hiromu rides often. Hey, phrasing! He has a positive outlook on life, but has no sense of direction whenever he's traveling. Next is Gorosaki Banana, Ryuji's partner. He's pretty much the most caring toward Ryuji, but never had the courage to speak his feelings towards him. Then there is Usada Lettuce, Yoko's partner. Unlike Nick and Banana, he doesn't have a suit actor, but is instead an animatronic. Love to see him get in a death battle with R2-D2. Usada is very overbearing and always has faith in Yoko's abilities. Last is Beat J Stag. As I mentioned before, unlike the other buddy roids, he has the ability to transform into a Go Buster. Hence, Stag Buster. Jay is very self-centered all the time and would usually cover Jin in most of his appearances, basically for comedic purposes. We also have the operatives in the Energy Management Center. There's Takeshi Kuroki, the team's mentor, the techs are Miho Nakamura, the girl with the glasses, and the guy with the Will Byers haircut is Tori Morishida. They're... meh. They don't have any character arcs or any development. Takeshi Kuroki is highly dedicated to shutting down Masai and... That's basically it. Why do you think I prefer Jin as a true mentor? And I don't think there's nothing interesting for Mio and Toru, but that's okay. The show acknowledges them as a support and how they should be thankful for supporting the Go-Busters. Then there's her own sister, Rika. She only appears throughout four episodes because my guess is that her actress, Risa Yoshiki, was busy. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> She is seen to be very protective of Hiromu at the start of the series, not wanting him to risk his life as a go-buster, something that she blames on Nick for instigating. She also had a fear of Megazords, which explains why she was never at the Christmas party 13 years prior. After seeing her brother win a battle, she becomes very supportive and gains respect for Cheetah Nick. Next is the villains, the Voglis. These guys are pretty much a joy to watch. First is Enter, and by god do I love this guy. In the earlier episodes, he has such a charismatic personality that's always backed up by constantly saying phrases in French that I find very enjoyable. He serves as Hiromu's rival throughout the course of the show. Once Escape is introduced, and during the Messiah Roid arc, he kinda lost his charm, but he's still engaging to watch because he becomes more calculating and manipulative, always having a backup plan if the first one fails. Near the end of the show, due to means which I will not spoil, he becomes Dark Buster, a more corrupted version of Red Buster, which is terrifying and badass looking. Halfway into the show, we are introduced to the lovely Escape, who has two very big guns that are a joy to look at. And she carries around two pistols with her. <laughs> Escape is a very arrogant fighter who always looks for a fight, finding a rival in Ryuji. She is shown to be very loyal to Messiah, constantly calling him Papa, as if he were her father. Due to this, she strongly distrusts Enter, always thinking he's planning to betray Messiah. It is eventually revealed that Enter, Escape, and Jin are avatars. No, 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 not those kind of avatars. No, not that one either. In this show, avatars are life forms created from data in the subdimension. Unlike the other two, Jin's avatar is a dummy body controlled by the consciousness of the real Masato Jin in the subdimension that enables him to act in the real world. Enter and Escape's avatar were created by Messiah. Speaking of which, we get to Messiah himself. At the beginning of the series, Messiah is a giant floating head virus that was trapped in the subdimension 13 years prior, so think of him as a fusion of Zordon and Vengex. To free him, his forces must acquire enough Enertron to free him so he can destroy the world. I do not like him. 
He's just this one-dimensional character who constantly whines that he wants humans to suffer and go through pain so it can entertain him, making him seem like a toddler. He only poses a threat when he becomes Messiah Cell in episodes 29 through 30 and Messiah Reboot in the Christmas episodes, but that's not enough to redeem his whiny nature. Thank God Enter became the big bad. There are also the foot soldiers known as the Bugglers. Uh, no, no, not burglars, Bugglers. I like how their designs are very droid like. The monsters of the show are known as Metaroids, robotic droids created by either Enter or Escape from normal objects. When we enter the Messiah arc, in order to gather data for Messiah, Enter used 13 Messiah cards, which when fused with any object becomes Messiah Metaroids. I have many favorite Metaroids, but a couple of them are Colorloid and Drilloid. My least favorite is Keshigomuroid and Omuchiroid. Just, who had the bright idea to make these things? Hopefully they don't get adapted when we get into Beast Morphers. Unlike previous Sentai shows, which would have the monster grow for the mech battles, the Metaroids actually have giant partners that are referred to as Megazords. Many enemy Megazords come in different types, like Alpha, Beta, Gamma, which is based off of Go Buster Ace, and Delta, which is a parasite Megazord based off of BC-04. Enter and Escape would have their own personal Megazords. Enter would have Megazord Epsilon, which first appears in the movie, and looks like something that would come out of Neon Genesis Evangelion. Escape has Megazord Zeta, which appears in episodes 42 through 44, and last is Megazord Omega, Enter's second Megazord that first appears in the Gokaiger crossover movie. Next is the Arsenal. The main henshin device is the Morphin Brace, which when the main button is pressed, a pair of sunglasses opens up on shouts, It's Morphin Time! Which is one of the many things fans love about this series. I like the Morphin Brace. It's blue, which is my favorite color, and it's a wrist morpher, which is my favorite type of morpher. The dial gives good detail that when you can turn it, it activates the brace's different features. The sunglasses make it look silly, but then again, it makes sense given that it can materialize into the sunglasses that form on the helmet. They also possess the Transpod, which when pressing the button, it can summon any of their sidearms, which can start out as everyday objects, and they can transform them into their weapons, mainly because of the spy motif. First is a Sogon Blade, which starts out as binoculars, and can transform into a combat blade. Then, there is the Ichigan Buster, starting out as a camera, and can transform into a laser magnet. The two can combine into the Ichigan Buster, Special Buster Mode. For Jin and Jay, they can transform by using the Morphin Blaster, which can transform from a phone into a blaster gun. Having their own transpods, they can summon the Dry Blade, which can transform from swords into steering wheels, mainly because Jin doesn't pilot his mech with his buddy Roy, and his buddy Roy can transform. At the beginning of the Messiah arc, the Go Busters are given their own power-up mode. By using the GB Custom Visor, they can fuse with their buddy roids and access Powered Custom Form. This form is... okay, in my opinion. The only thing that strikes out is the armor, and that's just it. Sometimes it's just hard to notice the modified gloves, and boots, and the silver lining on the visors. Function-wise, it's pretty cool. Red is given enhanced speed, which makes him look like he's teleporting, blue can create anything from whatever he touches, and yellow doesn't need a surface to hop on. After taming Tatagami Lyo, they find the Lyo Atashe inside of its cockpit, which can detect any metaroid and can control the aforementioned mech. It can also transform into the Big Bad Lyo Blaster, later combined with the Sogon Blade, that's some real firepower. But of course, you can't have a Sentai show without the giant mechs, which are called the Buster Machines. As mentioned earlier, the main three can control their mechs with their buddy Roy partners. The Buster Machines also have the ability to transform into animal form, with CB-01 being a cheetah, GT-02 becoming a gorilla, and RH-03 transforming into a rabbit. CB-01 can also transform into the main mech, Go Buster Ace, which finishes off most of the enemy Megazords in earlier episodes. All three can combine into Go Buster O. Jin and Jay would have their own Buster Machines, which can be transported from the sub-dimension. They pretty much have the same features as the others, vehicle mode and animal mode or insect mode if I were to be honest. BC-04 becomes a beetle, while SJ-05 becomes a stag beetle. The former can become Go Buster Beat, but can combine with SJ-05, becoming Buster Hercules. SJ-05 can also combine with Go Buster Ace, becoming Go Buster Ace Stag Custom, and enabling it to fly. Whenever enemy Megazords began to recreate the sub-dimension, for no apparent reason as it goes on, all five mechs can form the Great Go Buster. 
During the Messiah Void arc, the Go Busters tamed the aforementioned LT-06, which can be ridden by Ace in both tricycle and line form. Its main form is known as Tatagamelaya, which can also combine with the others. By combining with GT-02 and RX-03, it can form Go Buster Lyo and add BC-04 and SJ-05, you get Go Buster King. And of course, we have our movie exclusive mech, FS-00, which is a frog that can be turned to a submarine, piloted by a small buddy boy named Enatan. It can replace RX-03 to form Go Buster Carol O. Let's talk about the show story-wise. The show is very enjoyable in the first 30 episodes, building up to episodes 29 and 30, which feels like a great mid-series finale. The episodes after are just a two-part crossover with Gavon's successor, Geki Jumanji, aka Gavon Type G. It doesn't do anything to enhance the story, and it's just there to promote the Gavon movie that came out at the time to celebrate the aforementioned hero's 35th anniversary. Onwards, we enter an arc where the team fights off the Messiah Metaroids and gain their power custom forms. This is where the series begins to lose its enjoyability, but that doesn't make it bad. Fortunately, it picks right back up when we hit the Christmas specials and the episodes onwards. I think the main reason for the shtick that the second arc had was mainly because, as I mentioned earlier, Go Busters was doing poorly in Reigns, which was probably caused by the first half alienating viewers with its tone and style. Regardless of its failure, Go Busters had a well-told narrative which I can sum up in four different themes. First is Destiny, which is what they all had and chose because of the incident that happened 13 years prior. They all had burdens that they had to dealt with and they wanted to bury them by eliminating Messiah. Second is Flaw, which is probably the main reason for the weak points. They all had flaws that was either comedic or treated with seriousness, but that's what made them imperfect, which is what makes you human. Then there was Bond, which is probably the main reason for the Buddy Wards and the connection that Ryuji and Yoko have. Bonds are what make them stronger, and Powered Custom was a symbolization of that, given that they fuse with their Buddy Wards. Last is the Termination. Whenever our heroes went up against very extraordinary threats like Messiah, Escape, or Enter, they had the determination to boost them through the battle and achieve victory. Their pass are what enhances that determination they have. And, at some points, they were determined to sacrifice themselves to achieve victory. If you wanted me to choose which of these four was the main theme, I couldn't because they all intersect perfectly enough to become the main theme altogether, leading into the final grade of 4.7 out of 5 stars. Go Busters, whether you love it or hate it, is a very great show, and I'm glad it's getting adapted into Power Rangers Beast Morphers this year. But to do it true justice is if this were to be a good season, but we'll just have to wait and see. As I said earlier, Go Busters didn't do well unfortunately because of its unique style and the toy sales. The latter would make sense because it was about time for Japan to get sick of transforming robots, but the next series would be a huge success in the form of Juden Sentai Kyoruju, which is a show for another day. Time to spin the Wheel of Toku to see what franchise we're going to next. Next time, we'll be joining our favorite bug-themed cycle rider superheroes known as the Common Riders as we venture into... A show that as well was very unique from previous installments. Next time, we delve into Japanese culture as we join the Oni on their quest to eliminate the Makamo with their musical-based weapons in... Common Rider Hibiki.